The beginning of the 18th dynasty is marked by the expulsion of the Hyksus by Ahmuz, and it was the beginning of the new kingdom. Amenhotep I pushed the southern border of Egypt much further south into Nubia. The Epirus Papyrus, an important text from his reign, not only tells us a great deal about medical knowledge, but also contains the date of a heliacal rising of Solis. It is an aid to determine the chronology of ancient Egypt. From Tahotmos I, Tahotmos II, Tahotmos III, to the long and peaceful reign of Amenhotep III, Egypt experienced a period of unheard of prosperity. Queen T gave birth to Aminhotep. His father was King Aminhotep III, who was one of six or seven known children by Aminhotep III and T. During his early childhood, his birth relegated him to a secondary position in the royal family. His own birth was preceded by the crown prince Tahotmus and the princesses Sitamin, Hinutanib, Iziz, and Nebitah. It is thought that Ikhnaton was the youngest amongst them. Although many of the dates of birth of him and his siblings are not known for sure, it could often be easily to trace a hereditary king's early life in ancient Egypt. But this was not in the case of Echnaton. This was because he was born a younger son, who would have never held a position of prominence within the immediate royal family. Accordingly, his name couldn't be expected to be found in inscriptions. Queen T was their mother. She is one of Egypt's more famous queens and she had a great amount of power granted upon her. Toya and Yuya proudly proclaimed her as their daughter, and her mother Toya had few doubts about declaring their relationship in her tomb. Aminhotep III had come to Egypt's throne at a very young age, around 12-13 years old. T married him. T had not had a great beauty, especially in comparison with her successor Nefertiti. Scholars always questioned T's race. This was because of the inconsistent coloring found in some of the sculptures and relief images of her. Like the previous kings of his dynasty, Amenhotep IV built a temple within the temple complex of Karnak. But this temple's precise location is unknown because it was subsequently dismantled. One of the texts that were discovered demonstrates how the pharaoh's favorite god, the Aton, figures prominently. It was known as the Gimbatan, the Temple of the Atone. However, one small temple in the Karna complex wouldn't be enough. Ikhnaton's fun diversion scheme's primary target was the Amun cult which was based in Tiba. The influence of Amun in the new kingdom was ubiquitous. Accordingly, the move had far-ranging and long-lasting implications. There is no clue that suggests Ikhnaton's scheme was violent but it was clear that his prerogative as the king was used to take resources intended for their temples. Those funds were used to construct the Aton temples in Memphis, Heliopolis, Anoba, and probably somewhere in Delta. During years 2 to 5 of Echnaton's reign, it is thought that his final shift may have happened. The unusual occurrence of Echnaton's first Hepsid festival was during his second year in power. To confirm the king's ability to continue ruling and to display his continued reality, the Hepsid festivals were traditionally celebrated. It was most often to held the festivals after 30 years on the throne, and every subsequent 30 years. In years 30, 34, and 37, Amenhotep III celebrated three Hepsids. Still, it wasn't unheard of for a king to bend tradition to meet his own purposes. A Hepsid festival was a time to celebrate and reverently 
for all people. Also, it could be used for celebration of some other events in the monarch's life. On the other hand, it could be used as a political tool to appease the populace. But in the case of Echnaton, the early Hepsid may have been prepared to mark the changes that were about to happen with the evolution of the Aton as the dominant deity. It may have also been intended as a royal celebration of something. For example, a birthday. In any case, it was an odd occurrence. By Amenhot of the fourth, fifth year of rule, in the shadow of Egypt's older gods, he apparently determined that the Aton could not shine as it needed to. So the king decided to move north and build a new city dedicated completely to the Aton. The stage was set for the king to change his name and the way in which gods would be viewed in the Nile Valley. Echnaton's wife was Nefertiti. Egyptologists figured out that she was a queen of the new kingdom Egypt during the later era of the 18th dynasty. Her name means, the beautiful one has come. The bust of Nefertiti was discovered after the glamorous discovery of the tomb of Tut Anhamun in 1922 by Howard Carter. It caused an enormous sensation. Her family was not known to the archaeologists and even they did not know where she came from. No inscriptions or letters that document her heritage or her early life. So the details of her early life are comprised mostly of surmise pieced together from different fragments of the historical record and archaeological evidence. Over the years, historians have had arguments about her origins. Like Queen T, Nefertiti was seen repeatedly alongside her husband Echnaton. She has been featured many times on the temple walls of not only the temple of Aton at Achitaton, but also at Karnak. Although later rulers destroyed their monuments and images, the surviving pieces of Talatat, the small building blocks used for the construction of the monuments and the temples of the Amarna period that have been catalogued from both Karnak and Amarna show that Nefertiti was the prevailing figure in many scenes. Amarna was a city that was especially built for its ruler to focus attention on the worship of the god Aton. Unlike other cities, it wasn't a city that grew and developed over time. Much of the art was discovered in the tombs near the city. The remains of Echnaton's elite inhabitants were discovered in those tombs. Multiple depictions of life in Achitaton, like scenes of the king racing chariots from the North Royal Palace down to the Southern Administration Palace, were found. Other scenes describe the king appointing and rewarding his officials from a balcony of the Southern Palace. In other representations, the Temple of Aton is a feature. You can find small shrines from private homes with images of the royal family. This includes one that shows the queen and the king playing with their young daughters. Around 1340 BC, Nefertiti's past was likely created. It is 44 pounds and life-sized, carved from a single block of limestone. The concept of a royal portrait was nothing unusual in ancient Egyptian society. The temples and palaces of Egypt are full of them. What makes this portrait unique? Its depiction of the queen. While we're familiar with the sole monumental and blocky portraits of Egyptian rulers, Nefertiti's past looks vastly different. Not only is the face carved with strong chin, softly carved cheekbones and sharp nose, but the limestone core was covered in gypsum stucco, which was then painted. The result is an incredibly lifelike depiction of the queen. It is colored with red lips, golden brown skin, crown, and colored jewelry. The eyes are set with crystal, and one pupil is made with black wax. The other eye was never finished. This masterpiece of art was discovered in the workshop of Tohotmos, the favorite artist of Echnaton and the official court sculptor. This bust was discovered in Tohotmos' studio in Amarna, and this means that the bust was probably just a model. It seems that Tohotmos created this as just a reference, and he was planning to make other royal and possibly monumental portraits. Inside Tohotmos' workshop, archaeologists discovered also a series of partially completed busts, faces, and masks. Many of these were extraordinarily realistic showing faults and wrinkles and all the other characteristics of an individual face. When modern researchers scanned the semi-completed bust, 
They found out that the original portrait looked a little different. The cheekbones were less defined, there were wrinkles on the cheeks, and the nose had a characteristic bump to it. The history of the city of Amarna is just a blip compared to thousands of years of Egyptian history. It lasted only about 30 years, but the Amarna period stands out as a distinct era in ancient Egypt.